Hey, welcome back, everybody. Of course, you know me. My name is Dr. Keith McNally. This is the Question Guy podcast. I have here Zoom has got everything all jacked up. This is Tina, Tina Fornwall. You did it. Nice, nice, nice. All right. And when we did our pre-call, and because I wanted to know more about you and what you're all about, you have a, you've got a sad story, but it turns out well in the end. You have got an empowering story, and I really want you to share that with the world. Where do you want to get started? Thank you. And I think when we step back and look at our lives, we all have sad pieces, but it can be empowered depends on what we focus on. Sometimes the things that happen to us seem to take over everything. And I think I learned how to do that early on being from Chicago. My dad was a police officer. Uh, There's a lot that comes in being raised in that type of household. Our mom stayed home full time. So there was a lot of structure in my life, um, being a police officer, a lot of being driven by our dad to make sure that what success looks like. And that propelled me to go into the military. I served in the US Army for 21 years, as retired as a warrant officer in logistics and in the military is where I actually met my late husband, Mark Cornwall. So Army, 20, 21 years? Yes. Well, one, of course, thank you for your service. But what was that like? That's a long time in the <laughs> in the army. And I guess is your did your husband pass in while he was in the army or he did not. So yeah. the army, I personally believe that I think the United States would be very different if everyone had to serve a year or two. I think it gives you a perspective of serving this country and what that looks like. Mm-hmm. I come from a very servitude family. Our dad was in the Air Force. M- one of my sisters was in retired from the Navy and my youngest sister re- was in the Marines. Our brother was on the U.S. American bobsled team and one sister a uh, retired teacher in Chicago, Illinois. So my family is about serving. So I say that to say Military life, it will make you show up. Uh, I remember this scrawny little girl leaving Chicago, never particularly had left home, uh, went on the plane for the first time, flying to Fort Dix, New Jersey, to boot camp. And we're standing in line the first day, and these drill sergeants are coming down screaming, and I'm watching these women start crying. And it dawned on me. So I'm 57. We got spankings. And I was like, they can't touch us. Like, they're just going to be yelling all day. I could take this all day long. <laughs> I, I dealt with worse. So doing push-ups, learning, becoming disciplined was easy for me from the way that I was brought up. It served me well. Um, over time, I want to say, went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for boot camp. I went to my technical school at Fort Lee. And then I met my late husband at my second active duty station. And we lived down the hall from each other. And in the barracks, it sort of set up maybe like a college dorm. There was like a swinging door back and forth. And we had some mutual friends. And he really didn't look look like somebody I was interested in. Because I am 5'9". And we're the same height. Every girl wants this guy. Well, not every girl, but this girl. This girl wanted somebody that was taller. And he seemed nice. But I was like, "Eh, nah, he's short. It wasn't sure, but it was the same height. So I was like, when I wear heels, how is this going to work? So I was like, ah, but he slid his way in there. And we, a group of people went out to the movies and we saw a few good men. And after the movies, he said, do you want to go get something to eat? And so now he, he broke it off from the big group date to like, he and I going to do something. And I was like, okay, Pizza Hut. I mean, I like pizza. And it was funny because he was the first person I ever saw like with a knife and fork, like eating pizza. And I'm wanting, right? That was my look on my face. Like I wanted to pick that puppy up and grab it. And so you're from Chicago. Deep dish, right? Wow. So I'm a, yeah, I'm about that work. And at some point I go to the bathroom and I'm walking back and he's looking at me so intensely. I'm like, okay, he's feeling me. I get to the table. He says, you got toilet paper on the bottom of your shoe. <laughs> I was like, This is probably the last date with the short guy. Like, this is it. But we hit it off. 
Um, I eventually had orders to Korea for 18 months, which allowed me to choose the duty station I wanted to return to, with, which put me in proximity to Mark. And we got married. We I purchased a Dodge Colt, had a $500 rebate, and that was our honeymoon money. And <laughs> we went and did that. And we were together for 32 years. We have two children, uh, Catherine Alexander, who both have served in the Navy. I won't fault them for that. Their dad and I were in the Army. I'll, I'll accept it. But, you know, we all have a moment when this life is going to be over. A lot of times we want to say if something happens. But for good planning, the reality is when it happens. And I want to be clear on that because when Mark and I got married, we talked about when one of us was not going to be here. How would that leave the other person mentally, spiritually, economically, and what things do we need to put in place? Those were not easy conversations, but by doing them up front, the plan was enacted. All we had to do is do the steps to keep it engaged. Those conversations are not what people want to talk about, but when someone you've loved dies, <laughs> It's hard to try to figure those things out then. So we were on vacation um, in Delaware. I Mark had we lived in Pennsylvania. He had taken a job in Virginia. We were trying to relocate to this area. And he had a job first. I was still working on getting a job. And we got together for the weekend. Uh, is this an adult-only conversation? Go with it. Uh, it was a booty call weekend because we had not seen each other for a while. Got it. So <laughs> we were trying to make sure we were, you know, making up for lost time there. You mean, And I didn't know that that was going to be the last weekend I would see him. He had spoke about in his family there was chronic heart problem. He had a cousin at the age of 35 that had died of a heart attack like during the holidays. And he was very adamant that he was not have a long life. And we were actually moving to Virginia because we wanted to reduce our way of living, economic responsibilities, and just have a little bit more fun. He had a heart attack that weekend, and that was the last time. And I am so grateful that we were together because my husband was wonderful. And he was going to leave this world that date and time. So I'm glad we were together instead of the one bedroom apartment we had set up for him in Virginia. He deserved better than that. It was the most horrific experience in my life. I had just been dealing with breast cancer. And when he had a heart attack and died that weekend, I know everybody was thinking, wait, wait, Mark died, but Tina was battling cancer. What just happened here? So I was there when my husband had the heart attack. We were in a hotel room and my life was shattered. Well, you now you've got me because, oh my God, and I never had a loss for words. Um, can you talk about that specific experience? And I only ask yes. because I had a heart attack and I'm not trying to trump the conversation here at all, but so I know I should I should be dead basically because it was a mm -hmm. severe heart attack, and so I know what that experience is. I, we can't ask him because he's not here. What was, what was what was going on with you, in okay, that whole so, time? So I think you're asking for more of the details and a little bit more graphic, and I don't have a problem with it. I just wanted to be certain. So because this were... is this is your transition, and it's <laughs> what, oh my god! I mean seriously. Yeah. Tell me it, about I'm it. okay with so we Mark was in Virginia and I was in Pennsylvania and my job required me to, to travel a lot and I had a strong sense that I should I had a work travel that week I was supposed to go to Huntsville Alabama and I could just really hear God saying you know you need to cancel that trip and I was like like, is the plane going to blow up? Like, what's going to happen? Like, is it going to be that movie where it goes, what happened to you that summer? And and I, But I just could not go on that trip. And I worked with people. Now, this is 2017. The whole virtual thing wasn't a big popular scenario. And But they canceled the trip, and we decided to do it virtually. 
And then I just heard God say, you really need to spend time with your husband. And I had a lot of things planned that I was supposed to do at church that Sunday, but it just was so strong. And I canceled some um, requirements that I had. And I called my Mark and I said, he want to get together? Well, what is any husband that likes his wife? And I said, well, yeah, I want to get together with you. Exactly. So I remember um, getting there and I remember us going upstairs to the hotel room in, on base. And then I left something and I remember us playfully going back down to the car to get it. I remember us going to see the last Wolverine movie and we had Chinese buffet, which is so funny because Mark is a steak and potatoes, Pennsylvania kind of guy. So the fact that his last meal was Chinese buffet, he may be blaming that for me for eternity because I prefer Chinese. But he said, let's have it. <laughs> we had a good night. Um, I'll just say that uh, he uh, entered eternity with a smile on his face. Um, and the next day he had gas really bad. And he had been to the doctor and they had given him something for it, but it seemed really bad. He was sweating. And I said, I think we really should go to the hospital or the emergency room. But what are guys famous for not wanting to do? Just suck it up. There we go. And that's what he did. And he took a nap. And I remember taking a picture of him and sending it to the kids saying, your dad is sleeping. And they wanted to talk to him. He got up and he was in the bathroom and he was sweating like buckets of water. Mm -hmm. And I went in to check on him and I was like, I think we should go to the hospital. And he said, no, it's just gas. And I was like, you know, we're having a really good weekend. I don't want to be the pesky wife because we need to go. We need to go. And I was like, you know what? We got lost and didn't even argue about it. I was like, I'm not about to be the one to ruin this. So I went and sat down on the bed. I was doing something for work. And I heard a loud noise go thump. And I ran over there and there was blood everywhere. And in my mind, like he's on the floor because he hid his nose on the counter and that blood is what it was. Um, I didn't know where we were like to call an ambulance to come get us, but I called downstairs to the front desk and told them what was going on military uh, people come, uh, medical people, MPs. I'm a retired officer, so there's a lot of people in the room. I am at the end of the hall screaming on the phone, too hot on know at that point. If it was my sister or a friend and screaming, I love him. How can this be happening? Is this how our story ends? Like, is this really like, is this what's going on? Like, is this for real mm. and they get him and they take him and then they the mp gives me the address and i was like sergeant i am not traveling that which one of you are getting in the car with me or you're escorting me i have no concept my mind is slipping i get to the hospital uh they escort one rides in the vehicle with me another is driving and i get there um and i let them he didn't have any id so i told them i said um so that white guy that came in, that one's mine. I need you to know that that's, that's my husband. He has no idea. And they're looking at me. I was like, yeah, we need to get going. And the doctor, um, they put me in this room. And I was like, this is not good. They don't put you in a room. This is, this is not good. And I remember having a sheet of paper and trying to write down stuff because I needed to tell our family and friends what was going on. And I wasn't sure what I was retaining. And he came in the room. And he said that your husband has had a major heart attack. And I was like, okay, I'm not a medical professional. I'm a project manager, logistician by trade. I said, what does major mean? And I want to say he said about 75% of his heart stopped operating. And so I knew it wasn't him sweating this slip. If only 25% of your heart is circulating blood throughout your body, he didn't have the capacity to stand. And that caused the fall. And they said, we need to know if we'll just make it through the night. And in my mind, I was thinking, okay, I'm going to take off from work. I'm going to nurse him back to help. I'm, I'm project mode thinking about it. And the doctor saying, no, no, we need to see if we're going to make it through the night. And I started losing it emotionally. And I was like, so you're telling me I need to call my children 
My son was active duty in the Navy. Uh, my sister that's retired from the Navy started engaging Red Cross to get him there. Our daughter was in Pennsylvania three hours away. I called a family friend and said, she needs to be here immediately. It went from one IC room to another. And I remember the doctors coming in very professional and they were like, well, your husband, I said, you know what, all of that, I need you to put all that down. I need you to talk to me like your wife is that person. Cause I saw you had a wedding band, your spouse is having this experience. And I want you to talk to me like it cares to you. And that shifted the dynamics of this conversation from this very stoic medical professional to, yeah, my husband is barely hanging on and I need you to talk to me like my husband is barely hanging on, not the next person you're going to room to room. Mark had a DNR. I knew all those different things, but no one really wants to use it. Going back to the planning that we did up front, I wasn't at this place trying to grasp and figure out what he wanted. I knew the check mark, but it wasn't something I wanted to utilize. I remember walking through the hallway, following the doctor to the next ICU room, and some people were walking by me talking about what they wanted to have to eat. And I was like, when will I ever care like what the next meal is? I'm just trying, because you, you, life is, life keeps on going stop, on. But yes. your life has stopped, yeah. It's offensive, like how it keeps going on. Yeah. And so, so I'm in the rape, I'm in the waiting room, and I remember talking to one of my children, and I they they put me in the room and said, "Well, Miss Formal, we're going to come get you in a little while so you can see your husband." And when I was sitting in the room, I kept hearing "code such and such." Cold such and such. And in my heart, I was like, that's Mark. That is him. But I'm no one say anything to me, so I'm not going to say anything to them. I'm talking to people on the phone. People are now traveling from Pennsylvania and from Virginia because we're in Delaware in the middle. And two of the nurses come in and I stand up and I'm screaming. And it was like, no, we did not come to tell you that because I was and I was like, we just came to tell you that we're still trying to get him situated. And I asked them, every time I hear that coding, is that him? And they said, yes. And I started to resolve the reality. This may not end well. And eventually the same doctor that had been with me before, he came in and he got down on his knee and he put his hands on my on my on my knees. He's on his knees and he's like resting on me. He said, "I know you said your husband had a DNR, and he has coded out multiple times. What do you want us to do?" And just as I was prepared to say, I was talking on the phone to the children, and it was like, "Daddy would not want that to happen." He was very clear. But nobody wants to say that. No one wants to have to utter those words because there's a part of you that can have the guilt that you killed them, that you were part of the end. Yes, you're honoring their desires, but when you have to make that decision, that weight is heavy. And somebody had came in and said that he didn't make it. And I was beside myself. Because we had been together for 32 years and I love him now. And I sometimes we would say, well, I like you. Like that was over loving you. Like you could say, I love you, but it's like, I like him. And I wanted to see him immediately. And it was like, no, we have to um, make him presentable. They needed to remove different, um, I guess, apparatus they were using to try to, you know, help him live. And I remember walking into that room and until this point, I had never touched a dead body. That was not something that had been in my uh, preview. Most people have not, but I had no hesitation. He had a Band-Aid on the bridge of his nose and I was like, that's where he hit and there was the blood there and I lost my mind. I screamed, I cried, I was on the floor, I was beating, I was devastated. And I am so thankful to the medical staff that did not come in and rush me out. They let me lose myself and get it. The only time they came in, 
was to say that your daughter has just entered the building and she will be here soon. And I had enough time to get my composure to be there for my daughter. Um, family and friends came from Maryland, Virginia. They Some came to the hospital where Mark was. And when we got back to the hotel, cause a lot of us military, they had moved the room and put us someplace else. And, but there were a couple of things we had to go back to and they did a, a wonderful job cleaning that room. Like there was not like we were, it was, you still, there was some smears, but it wasn't the scene that I had left. And we moved our items over and my friends and family showed up in a way that I could never realize how big that was until my journey continued and talking to other people who had lost spouses and realized people would tell them stuff like, it's been 12 or 13 months, why are you still sad? I never had anybody say something like that to me or make me feel like my grief was not valid. And that is the granular part of what happened there. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And even I'm holding back tears. I'm doing my best. I have a handkerchief is, here because I wasn't that, sure how this was going to go. <laughs> that Well, I don't. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't expecting that, but I am appreciative. So what happens next? You, you did something wonderful as a result what, of all that. What happened next was me giving myself space to grieve. Yeah giving myself space to say this man that I love and will always love and spent 32 years unexpectedly to me died on a lover's weekend and my life is altered. The first three months I didn't go back to work. Um, I don't know if I bathed a lot. The one thing I did do was get a personal trainer because I needed a reason to draw myself out of the house. I would go for long walks. I immediately saw a therapist um, the day before I saw his body the first time because this is uncharted territory. Uh, people were reaching out, providing books and material. I traveled literally across the United States connecting with other widows to understand how in the world do you function? Like, how do you sleep at night? How does this work? So I started creating my community of people that I could help leverage therapy, connecting with other people, writing, not being afraid to talk about how I was feeling, giving other people permission to talk about. I remember the one year anniversary of Mark's death. And I remember reaching out to people saying, what happened that day on your side? Because mm -hmm. I called some people to come get his car. All I told him is he died and I need you to get his car. They said, okay. A year later, they then told me they were at a birthday party for somebody and da, 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 and how they told people. But they would have never, like you just said, you weren't upgrading your heart attack to make that. No one was going to tell me what happened for them. But when I gave people permission to share, I knew I wasn't hurting alone. I was hurting differently, but I had a community with me. Um, when I'm, some friends here in Virginia uh, packed up his apartment for me, I didn't have to come. Eventually, I did move to Virginia. And when I tell you I have some good friends, um, 2,600 square foot house packed up on a semi here, picked out a place I never lived before. My sister was here. She helped me sign the lease for a condo. My girlfriends came, unpacked the kitchen, the bedroom, the bathroom. So when I pulled up to that condo, they were there to meet me. They greeted me. They had that bottle of white wine on chill with the ice bucket. And I was able to take a good bath, cry, and get in bed. And I have to worry about unpacking and doing all of that. And it was like, okay. I, t I was like, okay, Mark, I made it. What are we going to do now? And over time, me re being the person reaching out to other widows, it became other people reaching out to me like how are you able like to talk about it how are you able because no one wants to talk about death we want to make it that obscure thing to the side it's a passage we all have to experience 
whether we are the survivor of someone dying or it is our time to pass through that journey. And it just became people talking to me and giving people permission. In fact, literally 10 minutes before this call, I was connecting with a widow whose husband just died two weeks ago. And she obtained my number for my brother and was on the phone with her to talk. It's not that you have to do something miraculous, but when you just show up and give somebody space to and sit there with them, it is very powerful. So I've learned to be there for other people, showing there's a verse in the Bible that talks about loving people with the love that has been given to you and showing up for people as people have shown up for you. And that is what I've learned to do. I love it. And I can't ask you to go any further. One, for time. And two, that was just an amazing story. I would like to bring you back. Maybe there's more to the story that you can tell. But before we kind of close this call, for those who have just listened and watched, you tell a heartbreaking story, and I'm still holding back tears. For those women who are in a situation where they've just lost somebody, can you give them a word of comfort, please? Yes. It will be hard. I don't want to try to sugarcoat that but you are not alone. There is a community of people going on this journey with you. And there is strength to be found in connecting with other people. When you find out that you're not the only person up at 2 a.m., that the separation of your heart, that you can connect with other people, that life can still have joy and purpose in time. It's not something you have to rush yourself through. Give yourself time for the sadness because that sadness will oftentimes turn into joyous memories. And just give yourself grace to know it's a process. And in that process, like you went to school, it was horrible doing homework. You graduated, you got through it. This graduation is huge, but it's still a process. Nothing happens that quickly and give yourself time and allow those that will love you and sit on this journey with you to do that. And don't give a lot of energy to the people that you thought were going to show up and they didn't celebrate those that are there and give your energy to that. I love it. Tina, I'm going to leave your contact information in the description of this video in the show notes, if that's okay. Yes. Thank you for this conversation. For those who are watching and listening, This has been another edition of the Question God podcast. I'll see you next time. Take care.